Hello, my name is Brian Arnell. I'm with Oklahoma State University. My position is Precision Nutrient Management Extension Specialist. I hold a three-way appointment with Extension Teaching and Research. My responsibilities to the state are to, to help producers with nutrient management and precision technologies. So I get to work with everything from lime management to variable rate NPK and lime. And a big part of my research program and extension program has been the application and adoption of sensor-based nitrogen rate management. I'm going to take the time today to talk about some of the history in nitrogen management in winter wheat. Where have we gone? Where are we going? And some of the, uh, the results from our work. So first, a lot of this work I have to give credit where credit is due. The greatest majority of all the sensor-based work comes from three, three individuals, at least at Oklahoma State. That's Dr. Bill Ron, Dr. Marvin Stone, and Dr. John Solis. Both Dr. Soli and Stone are ag engineers who have passed. Dr. Ron is still active in the soil fertility uh, research and development of this. But it all went back to managing nitrogen in a state that has a lot of variability. This graph right here really shows how variable our yield and our efficiencies are. So if we look at our state is dominated by dry land, hard red winter wheat production. Average yields between two and seven ton per hectare are really common. This data right here comes from one of our long-term nitrogen rate studies that's out in Northwest Oklahoma, the Lahoma Research Station. Across it, we look from the 2004 to 2018 crop year. You can see yields at economic optimum end rate going from anywhere two ton to almost six ton. Now those yields come at a range of nitrogen rates. So the orange bar is yield, the black dot right here, that's the optimum rate. One of the first things you can observe in this is that yield and nitrogen rate are not correlated. We're not saying that nitrogen uptake is not correlated with yield, but of course nitrogen rate is not because so much goes on. This line down here is imp important for me as we look at our traditional recommendations. You know, our traditional recommendation is two pounds of amper bushel or 30 kilo per ton. You look at our annual optimum nitrogen rate per ton produced or per kilo produced, per, per bushel produced, you know, it's all over the board. We go anywhere from zero to 54 kilos per ton. That's effectively zero to 3.3 pounds of M per bushel. That's all over the board. Our average, however, though, is right at about 27, so, or at 20. So we're, we're below what we recommend, but we're honestly pretty close to what the crop is removing on an overall basis. It's just hitting that year to year. So how do we do that? I break down everything we've done at OSU back to the Stanford equation as the mother of all nitrogen recommendations. And I can really break down what we do based upon this. So the final infertility recommendation is based upon the nitrogen in the crop minus nitrogen in the soil divided by a fertilizer efficiency. Now I use this Beagle and Morel slide deck all the time because I really believe it shows the complexity, the simplicity and complexity of nitrogen rate recommendations. And so as we go through the sensor based recommendation, I'm going to break down these three components on how we get it with our sensor and our sensor based nitrogen rate calculator. So the first component we're going to look at So the first component we're going to look at is the nitrogen in crop component. As we already noted, yield is highly variable. Due to our rainfall, due to our, our climate, we have yields all over the place. So even in a single location, our yields go from two to seven ton very easily over a 10 year window. So the nitrogen in the crop, that component is a big challenge for us to get. And when we're planting a crop in October, the probability that we can predict what's going to happen by harvest in June is almost bare minimum. It is 
we have no clue when we put that seed in the ground what that final rate's going to be. So we've got to admit that anything made up front, that is nothing more than speculation to guess. We are unable to predict the weather, so therefore we're unable to predict final grain yield. So what we've looked at is this, is let's let the crop tell us in season how is it doing? And so with that, there's many years. This right here comes from Dr. Ron's website at nue.okstate.edu, coming from the long-term fertility trials, showing their approach in yield prediction model. Now this isn't, this is more of a yield potential model is what look at it this, and you see the average line, they're actually using the dotted line for yield potential. It's that, that one standard deviation above the curve because we want to go at it that, you know what, the highest probability is something bad will happen to our crop after sensing. So we're not going to account for post-sensing stresses, but we want to up identify that upper curve, that upper boundary of the yield potential. As you know, we may have trash down here, but we're pretty clean on that upper boundary. And so that's what we're wanting to predict is what is that potential. We do that based upon NDVI and days from planting to sensing where there's growing degree days greater than zero, meaning there's a day of growth. We get often asked, why aren't you using cumulative heat units? And it's really because of our fall, because we can really accumulate a lot of heat units in that fall, that October and November, that don't equate to yield. So to help normalize that and make our yield prediction better and remove some of the variability we get in the fall, it's GDDs greater than zero. And this gives us NC. NC is a non-unit value, but it's really an estimate of biomass produced per day and it's nicknamed or it's named in season estimate of yield. This is a yield potential, not really a yield prediction. We want to give that upper boundary. And so that's allowed us to go in. We collect these around Fikis 5, Fikis 6, and that gives us a pretty good estimate of yield. Now, how good are we doing? This is an example from, from a data set from, from research studies where you look at the red square is what we've predicted at the fix 5 timing. The green triangle is what we achieved in yield. Now what you'll often see is that we over predict yield. Why? We're sensing in February. This is almost all taken the first week of February to the second week of February. We're, we're doing that in February. The probability that things go great is often wrong. We have things happen. So if you look in years 2000, uh, in, in 10 and 2011, some significant droughts hit us and really reduced us. Then again, you have years like this. What we had in 16 and 17 was that at the time of sensing, from basically December to February, it had not rained. We had significantly reduced growth. We had significantly reduced yield potential. Shortly after sensing, it started raining again. Now, for this data set, we have errors there. But if I'm a farmer, that's when I go out and resense and make a prediction. But we're really happy with overall our capability to predict this. And I know this is in yield bushels per acre. This is a, a slide I've used for extension. But you see, we're pretty close in estimating anywhere from a 20 bushel yield to a 90 bushel yield across that time frame. It's great information to have for the producer in February to make in season decisions. Do I invest more in this crop or do I sit back and wait? And if it's a 20 bushel crop, it may be time to go uh, on vacation down to Mexico and just forget about whatever's happening in Oklahoma. The yield prediction models, there's been many made. And one of the important things that, that I like to reiterate when it comes to yield prediction model they should be regionally specific. Right here we show several. They all have the same shape. We're going to have that same ex exponential curve in regards to what crop, this is what I've come across. But we have regional specificity. In fact, we have a Kansas model, we have an Oklahoma model, and current research right now is developing within Oklahoma regional models. It doesn't work when you take Oklahoma and apply it in Missouri or Oklahoma and apply it in, in North Carolina. The shape of the model works. You can use the same approach but you can't use the same numbers. You have to have regionally specific data for these yield prediction models. And as we get more data around the state, we're building regionally specific models for the North Central, for the Southwest, for the Panhandle, for the Northeast. Why? The crop grows differently and our yield prediction is, is different. Our yield potential is different. However, to be honest, on average, our statewide model does quite good. 
So the other part, we have the three aspects of the Stanford equation. The nitrogen in the soil, how are we doing that? Well, if we look at it in the traditional method of pre-plant soil testing, you know, that's occurring in August or September when we're really top dressing in January and February. So there's little value of it in that. And in season, folks, there's not a whole lot of people in hard red winter wheat country that's going to go out in February and take pre pre-side dress or pre-top dress nitrogen values. So we just don't have that. How do we accomplish that in our goal? It's nitrogen strip. It's why not let the crop tell us. Let there be a piece of litmus paper out there. Let the crop tell us what's happening. If it's responsive year, that means you have a lot of growth and little mineralization. You don't have a lot of available nitrogen. If you don't have a responsive year, that means there's plenty of available nitrogen for the crop that's there. So we're using this responsiveness to really appreciate or really tell us and dive into how much nitrogen is that crop able to see in the soil. Again, this is about what can the crop see. It's not about what we can test, not what we can hit with a soil sample or, or a prediction. It's truly what has the crop seen. Let us tell us the crop, what's the crop seen. The response index is simply the difference between a high and a low rate. Now we get a lot of this. This is the enriched strip has actually been the most popular aspect of our approach. We have many, many more people that use the enriched strip that don't use a seek, green seeker. It's truly what's been adopted. Why? Because there's so many different methods of application that have become quite popular. Honestly, consultants use ATVs with streamer nozzles or liquid. They're really uh, out there. Uh, these top two, this uh, it's a chem tote in the back of a pickup. This is a producer in southwest Oklahoma. This rig right here comes from a producer in northwest Oklahoma. Again, these are producers. This is a crop consultant on the ATV. We got a lot of people that just go rent a pool type spreader from the local co-op, or maybe they're using their anhydrous rig. Uh, we have a lot of people that just go out with their large sprayers and either use center boom or one boom to create an enriched strip across the entire uh, and across the entire field. However, to be honest, even though we have all these capabilities and all these technologies to apply enriched strip, the number one applicator in the state right now is a push spreader because of the simplicity. You don't need a trailer. You can move quickly. You put a bag of urea, a couple bags of urea uh, in the back of the truck and, or car or SUV or, or camera. It doesn't matter in this spreader and you can hit fields quickly. A lot of these strips are in zones so you might have a high zone and a low zone or just one strip in the field. They make it about 10 foot wide, about 100 foot long. We have strips of all shapes and sizes across the fields. Uh, and, and people are really adopting that and really seeing the value of having that test strip out there to let the crop tell them what's needed. It's truly letting the crop tell them. Now we have to have an adjustment when we approach Oklahoma because we, we, we acknowledge that the, the difference measured in season is going to be magnified as you get later in season. Now this graph here comes from my PhD's current work where he went out across the state and did YP studies. He did pre-plant rates, in-season rates, uh, a lot of sensors. We have the green ticker, we have the Holland, we have um, the Canapeo, we have multiple measurements just seeing so the orange line was the response index or, or the adjustment to response index that he's seen the black line is the one that osu has been utilizing for many years and so you see or i'm sorry the, o, the orange was the one osu has been using the black line was his so what you see is there's a shift so if we go here at an ri of two if it's two on the green seeker at at real time is more than likely closer to three that means an increase in 300 percent or threefold our yield if we fertilize and this is really important again for us to get a better understanding of what's in that soil what do we need to supply the difference we start then taking that into the full equation so this comes from uh, work uh, released by Dr. Ron back in the early 2000s and it really comes from this. It's the nitrogen fertilization optimization algorithm based upon the in-season estimates yield. And you have this, you have YP0, that's yield of the farmer practice, the unfertilized area, times the responsiveness. Now this responsiveness is the RI adjusted. And you subtract YP0, multiply it by a percent nitrogen, um, in the crop and divided by NUE. So this is all across the crop. Now, 
In simple terms, I would tell a producer, this is how we're doing it. If you go out and put an enriched strip out in the field, you're going to measure your farmer practice and you're going to measure the enriched strip. We're going to predict the yield between the two. If the farmer practice that you haven't fertilized can cut 40 bushel, the enriched strip which you have fertilized can cut 80 bushel, we know you need to supply the nitrogen to meet the difference, that 40 bushel difference. And on, on common efficiencies, that means you need to apply enough for 40 bushel or about 80 pounds of nitrogen. Now that's a very oversimplified method of what we do with the NFOA, but it does, it does hit the approach. In UE at OSU, you know, there's over 33 algorithms available. You can see the math between on every single algorithm that's on there. Dr. Ron also has a YP0 and NFO, NFOA cookbook. How do people do this on their own? And it's been used, folks. People in Australia have built their own farmers. People across the U.S. and the globe have utilized this cookbook and made their own. And Dr. Ron puts it up on the website free to access, free to use, free to test. Uh, there's another zoom in of the, the more of the algorithms. I always like to joke with my students that I can go into a couple of them. Luckily, I can slightly understand Portuguese, so I can go into the... Uh, the Brazilian work, but the, there's a Chinese algorithm in here that's completely Chinese, number 11. You know, we have no clue what the uh, translator put in on it. We also have several of them available on a mobile app, so producers can download this app for free, get the information either from the Mesonet, use a handheld green seeker, and they can get their own calculator. So we have a lot of opportunity and a lot of different mechanisms for producers to get a good flat rate. We often have consultants that are doing this and doing zones and getting three rates across the field and doing different zones, utilizing it for their own program, for their own consulting program. So in 2019, we're currently doing another survey, but in 2019, uh, we did a best estimate on how many strips are being used across Oklahoma and Kansas because we have a, a significant adoption across Kansas and even into Nebraska. And the best estimate was somewhere around a million acres of cropland are utilizing specifically the enriched strip approach or zero in approach. We have some high plains producers and irrigated corn that go with a zero in. And you can ask me later about how we do that, but it's basically the same approach. We're just going at it at a different angle. But about a million acres of winter wheat and sorghum primarily uh, utilized across Oklahoma and Texas. So it's being adopted. Now what's happened? So this approach in the market has really shifted some of the science behind what we're doing. So when this first came out, Dr. Ron and Soli and Stone were building this, Oklahoma was dominated by pre-planted anhydrous and even the good producers were doing a 50-50 split. And so a lot of the work, you'll see a lot of the stuff that's out there and currently in publication is showing the lack of response or it's hard to get a response. It's because of so much pre-plant. If you don't have a deficiency in nitrogen, the enriched strip won't show up. Well, both with a comfort of this approach and the change in market, we've had a significant shift in the Southern Plains away from pre-plant into starter only, which means they've gone from putting down 60 to 80 pounds pre to nothing, or, or at least eight to 10 pounds as a starter and nothing else. So this has actually changed. When, when we first started implementing this, we were waiting until March and April to see any difference because you had to burn through the pre-plant or lose it all through leaching or denitrification before you saw a response. Now we're getting responses earlier and earlier and earlier and so we've actually gone into more work to, to look into that. And so here's a couple of things. One of it is looking at the move from having pre-plant to not having pre-plant. And this is an analysis that has 34 site years from 2017 harvest to the 2020 harvest. And this goes across every corner of the state of Oklahoma where we can compare all pre-plant to all in season nitrogen application, meaning there is not a drop applied, not even starter applied. Uh, and all nitrogen is delayed in season at a FIX 6 to FIX 8 scale. So right before jointing and stem elongation. And we only had 31 of 34 sites respond to nitrogen. So we had, a, we had 31 of 34 sites respond to nitrogen. Of those, two of them, the pre-plant outperformed the in season. And one of those, it was because urea was applied in standing water because that was the date it was supposed to be applied here at Lahoma. We had seven times, so not many, but seven out of 31 locations, the in-season Fikis 5 
out yielded the pre plant at that same location, meaning we had a 23% return or 23 response to positive end season. And the big game changer for Oklahoma, which we do get protein premiums in half for the last three years, is that the delay until a FIX5 or FIX6 application statistic, statistically increased protein 68% of the time. So we're now able to tell producers, I'm not telling them wait till six. Uh, uh, and I'll show you in a second, we can even wait further. I'm not telling them wait that long, but we don't have to get in a hurry in January, meaning we have more time to actually allow these strips to develop, allow the weather and market to develop and determine what's doing. One of the coolest research studies I've ever been a part of, we submitted the first article to AJ back in September, where we delayed nitrogen, where the crop had it anywhere up to 150 growing degree days. It was fixed 10.5 in many cases when we received, when we applied the first amount of nitrogen. The summary for that, looking at how long past deficiency, because we didn't start applying until there was deficiency, how long past deficiency could nitrogen be delayed? It had nothing to do with deficiency in winter wheat. We were still achieving six and eight ton per hectare yields when the crop would go deficient in November, we wouldn't apply until March at FIX 7. So it really changed my approach to this and saying, you know what? We don't have to get in a hurry. Let's let the crop tell us what it truly needs. Let's wait till the weather is truly good for applying. And you can you have a window for our hard red winter wheat to apply effectively from January to late March. So that's a huge window that really lets us do a lot better job of making our nitrogen rate recommendations. Just real quick, throwing some testimonials in there, because the one thing I hear every time I go anywhere is it takes too long to put out and sense enriched strips, and it might be, but here are four of about the 200 people I work with daily, and here's what they say. Farmer in North Central Kansas spent 10 hours applying the strips and sensing, that's applying and sensing, across his 2,200 acres spread over a large area. In a single year, it returned him $42,000, which he could attribute to 4200 4, 4, per hour spent on the strips. Northwest Oklahoma, a producer out there, every year he rents a, a, a pull-type pull, a pull type spreader, puts behind his truck and hits his 3,000 acres. Every single year, um, he does that over all 3,000 acres. It takes him about three-quarters of a day, and he spread over a pretty wide range. Uh, but he accounts that to about $12, $12 per acre per year, either in increased yield or decreased nitrogen. And since he scouts his wheat anyways, he's not accounting the time to sense a strip because he's already out there looking. Southwest Oklahoma, completely different environment. That producer looks at his investment over 10 years. He spends about eight hours a year applying, eight hours a year reading. That's almost $800,000 or $4,800 per hour invested. Northeast Oklahoma, this is in a, in a corn soybean with a wheat rotation in there, so smaller fields, smaller acres. Uh, but looking at $15 per acre net increase over the income using the enriched strip and green seeker, he's looking at $1,800, $2,000 added. The strip is not something hard to do. I don't know why it gets in the head. Just put it out there. And I tell farmers, it doesn't matter whether you use a sensor or not. The strip is such an educational opportunity because if it shows up, you know you got to fix something. And if it doesn't show up, you know you can set back or apply. It doesn't matter. The strips are so intuitive. We even have gardeners doing them at any scale. If you've ever been to Stillwater, you should know this cup. Gardeners are using them on their winter covers to find out more about how their garden's doing them, and they're doing it with different nutrients to say, okay, this needs. This is a garden right here. It's about a 10 by 20. They used a Joe's cup to do, do two different locations and seeing where the nitrogen residual is going to be. They were then working this material back in and going to adjust their fertilizer for their tomatoes and bell peppers to keep them from growing, uh, get them to two rank and get good growth out of them. So it's not just fields. Finally, and this has always been my take home, is that my, our goal is to be truly site specific. And while models are great, and even our Oklahoma yield prediction model is great, we need to be more refined. And how do we do that? We've got to be more site specific. We truly need site specific information for site specific recommendations, which brings us to the on farm testing aspect of what this strip is. Enriched strips or zero end strips are truly on-farm testing to let us know what is needed. Uh, we have highly specific yield data, we have highly highly spatial specific uh, satellite data or imagery data, 
but we don't have recommendations as far as in needed per bushel. This is getting us closer and it's truly been a great potential in Oklahoma. And I like to share with everybody that I, I do these talks to is that the potential is already history. Is that in 2001, we were fertilizing over half meter by half meter at 16 kilometers per hour with this sprayer right here. And in 2003, we were doing almost, is about every two foot a row for every row going at a high speed. So it costs too much. The technology wasn't ready. We don't need to be there, but we can be there. We are capable of doing it if we wanted to go that far. So it's really cool to think that our history is our past. And what we've been doing is taking this high-tech stuff that we were doing in 01 and downscaling it or right-sizing it for the producers and the economics of scale to get where we truly needed to be. And right now, we're honestly in an enriched strip. And a, and a sensor that costs a couple hundred dollars that's doing a, a $10 per acre return on investment. Um, and it's been quite successful in our state. With that, I greatly appreciate the opportunity to share what, we, what we've been doing with you with uh, you here at Oklahoma State. Again, this, this work was done long before my time. It started in the mid-90s. A lot of people listening to this have been a part of it, whether it's Missouri or the Nebraska all those NUE conferences over the years, researchers beating up on each other to really having discussions have really fleshed out a product that is impacting producers of the Central Great Plains in a positive manner. And I thank so many people for being a part of this at such a bigger and more grandiose scale that I could, I could ever say in time. Again, thank you for this opportunity. I hope everybody stays safe and enjoys this symposium.